So this uh, this time is uh, in the Christian world, of course, is Christmas time, and uh, and then New Year's, and so these events. You know, Christmas now is uh, kind of the international celebration, and uh, so you see Santa Claus and and. Uh, Plastic snow in Bangkok. <laughs> uh, it's a time where, you know, this, uh, in the world, uh, the uh, population pressures, uh, the environmental problems, the uh, and there's no end to the, you know, the conditions that we live on on this planet are uh, somehow changing in a way that can be rather threatening and frightening to people and of course the tendency of the human mind is to is to uh, dwell on uh, what's wrong and and uh, the <coughs> worry and anxiety about the future and so just to point out like the thinking mind uh, it's important to really get some perspective on thinking because uh, that is a function we have that we're very bound into. We, we tend to experience our lives through perceptions, conditioned perceptions and words and concepts. And so we, you know, but when you really examine thinking, as a, you know, the habit of thinking, it's a, it's a critical function. Thinking is, is what they call dualistic, it divides everything up. And so, it, you know, this is good, this is bad, right, wrong, uh, good, better, best, bad, worse, worse, and and then we differentiate, we discriminate, this is red and blue and yellow, a man, a woman, and, and then we have various a cultural attitude about gender, about class, about religion and politics and and that, that we have, you know, just part of a cultural uh, conditioning we get from the family we're born into. So then this, uh, and the, the mindfulness is of course the way that we begin to get perspective on thinking because when you think about thinking, you, you know, you're just caught in the whirlpool of thinking. And, uh, and so to get beyond thought is, uh, is through mindfulness. And then to be able to objectify the thinking process, so you, you're looking at it not through views about it, but just observing how it works, like the proliferating tendency, the way the mind, when you start thinking or something stimulates a, a feeling and then you think and it, it goes off into a conceptual proliferation or papancha or prungdang in Thai. So this is, is like, uh, just notice how, how grammar works, English grammar, you know, so you, one word connects to another and these are patterns that we learn you know, from a, I mean, we're, we're learning the language. And so then we have various cultural assumptions that, that we all have from being, you know, attitudes about life and what's important, what isn't, what's right and wrong, according to a particular cultural conditioning that, that we have. So these are infinitely variable and then we, we think about them as right or wrong, good or bad. But to get outside of that dualistic trap is, in the only way we can really do it is with mindfulness. <coughs> so then, uh, mindfulness, sati, sampachanya, sati panya, these words are very significant. These are the kind of essence of Buddha's teachings. You know, this is what's so unique about it is that the emphasis, the importance that we gave on sati and panya wisdom. 
uh, so that because you know in 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 other religious conventions the uh, the doctrinal positions usually start from you know I believe in God or you know a statement that kind of metaphysical belief or uh, about an ultimate reality and and then the Buddha never did that he started from uh, the, an existential reality such as suffering dukkha. Uh, and, and just notice the difference, you know, like you're talking about universal love as a, a that's an inspiring concept, isn't it? Like we must love each other and unconditioned love, universal love is an all embracing uh, ideal and suffering is, is uh, even though we all experience it, there's nothing inspiring about it. <laughs> and so, we tend, you know, our, much of our life is trying to get away from it or, or you know, feel sorry for ourselves or blame others for it. And so then this, this emphasis uh, as a noble truth, as I've mentioned before, in contrast to, say, uh, theistic religions which start from a belief in, in the ultimate. And, uh, and just notice right now, as you're sitting here, you know, whether there's with the ultimate reality, you can't conceive that really. Try to conceive the ultimate reality, but you can observe suffering. So it's it's something, you know, that's recognizable. It's it's nothing esoteric or subtle. It's very obvious in itself. So the Buddha's emphasis on dukkha, you know, where you, you use that as, as it's kind of the, the clue or the key to the door because it's, it's nothing mysterious about it but it's, it's changing from just reactivity against it to understanding it and then it leads on to ultimate truth amata dhamma paramata satcha, or these words So when you t- like the, the, trying to conceive ultimate reality, then you get into difficult words like God, uh, because to me, you know, culturally, I was brought up as a Christian. So, so that word itself conveys uh, an old man <laughs> with a white beard up in the sky. You know, even though I know on on one level that's very childish and. Uh, but it, it, God tends to have have qualities, you know, like God the Father, God the Son, and so forth. These are qualities or uh, conditions, attributes that that get applied to ultimate reality. And the Buddha never did that. Ultimate reality can be recognized, but it has no attributes. It's not right or wrong, good or bad red or blue, male or female. And so, you know, your thinking process can't conceive that. It just goes blank and it's trying to conceive the inconceivable is, you know, an impossibility. So that's where mindfulness allows us to observe that, to discern, uh, you know, the difference. So then this word panya in Pali can be, it, the translation is discerning, which is not discriminating. When we use the word discrimination, then it, then it's the thinking mind about this being bigger, smaller, right or wrong, and this is better than that. So, you know, this is, this isn't as good as that. <laughs> That's discrimination. Discernment. What is discernible in in terms of panya is is uh, attachment and non-attachment, say. When you're mindful, then you, you discern attachment is like this, you know, so you, you, you're not saying anything about attachment is wrong, because as soon as you give it something like a, 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 an adje- adjectival condition, then it, then it becomes more than that. So. Uh, the important with mindfulness allows you to observe the results of attachment to 
suffering and then and to the causes of suffering and then then the attitude is letting go of the causes and then you 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 know as you as you trust your intuitive sense more sati and panya together then you you can recognize non attachment is like this or self what what is self you know the ego the the self view sakaya ditti or personality view is, is all built on words and concepts and attitudes and assumptions. So, you know, then, then, uh, when there's, you know, the self falls away when there's no words and, and you know, there's just awareness. And so you can discern anatta or non-self, discern it from self, which is, you know, my I, Madhya, Samedo and so forth, and then it becomes you know, on a conventional level, it, there's nothing wrong with that, but uh, ignorance and attachment to even the, my name is, uh, is, is suffering because I'm, I limit whatever, whatever condition I attach to, I'm bound into that condition, which is always a limitation and, and will always be a cause of suffering. So then, the awakened consciousness of an individual and the discerning ability is then developed through say what we call meditation or bhavana in Pali. Bhavana is actually the fourth noble truth where you're developing, cultivating the Eightfold Path from Samaditi. And so that is like mean translated as cultivating or developing this awareness, this uh, sati and panya in uh, as you live your life as a you know with the sitting, standing, walking, lying down postures, with the breathing, inhaling, exhaling, uh, or you know eating your food, putting on your robe, taking off your robe, uh, you know whatever you know just the daily routine that we use here, you know, whatever it amounts to, whether it's work or or being alone or in a group or whatever, the the awareness that the and panya then can we can discern that we're suffering, what are we attached to? So over the years, you know, in um, just integrating this Pawana into into life, the flow of my life. Now we use this, these noble truths as a constant reminder. So, if I'm upset or anxious or worried or offended by something or somebody, you know, then I'm suffering. And then when I recognize there's suffering, then you know, I know better than to blame somebody else. Even if they have been rude and nasty to me, I know that that's not the first noble truth. That's what they do to me, but how I, the suffering I create around what somebody says to me. And so by tracing it to that, then I can, you know, I get to the cause and the, and the, and the, and the, 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 the development of non-attachment to that cause, letting go of the cause and non-attachment. So just to, to, you know, see, because panya sometimes is used, in wisdom can be seen as a kind of discrimination, kind of high level of discrimination. But in, uh, but this word discernment in English is where you can actually know that the condition phenomena and the unconditioned. There's a discerning, a recognizing of it. Um, and so the recognition then, uh, it lead, you know, is where Panya then can operate. And, and of course we recognize the, the non-suffering through non-attachment, non-self, and uh, shunyata, emptiness, nibbana, uh, Niroda, all these words, uh, unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. 
they're, they're separate words but they're slightly different emphasis but they all come out to the same thing mm. so uh, uh, just to offer this as a as a reflection because it, it's a, you know this uh, this teaching is very it's very precise it's not it's not a fuzzy kind of vague path the Buddhist path it's not like a and if I think I'm not sure, maybe kind of thing, or uh, it's it's very clear. But in order to to see it clearly, the the first three fetters are the are is the are the obstruction. So, like for Sotapanna, the Sakyaditi, Silabhadramasa, Vichikija are are the um, obstruction to see that path. And so, you know, I encourage you to really investigate these fetters, you know, in, in your own mind, you know, so that it's a, because it, it does deal with like sakiditi, which is tra- probably like the ego or the self view. And, and in Silavata Maramasa, I use that concept for like just conditioning, like cultural conditioning, things that aren't particularly ego, but assumptions we make through through the conditioning process we've acquired culture, social identities and and that, that are part of uh, uh, assumptions, cultural assumptions we have uh, that aren't particularly a self you know, me and mine but they're an attitude that that is based on it, that it comes from ignorance and, and cultural conditioning and then, uh, and then, which he teach out, doubt is always the result of attachment to thinking. So one thing, like Zen Buddhism, uh, they kind of perfected that uh, koan style, which is a way of making deliberate way to make you doubt. <laughs> and so, you know, because we are so bound into wanting to know answers, solve problems, and they're, you know, to have security of some sort, like, this is the right way, and that's wrong, and you're doing it right, you're doing it wrong, and, and uh, then there's so many different views about meditation practice in Theravada, so, <clears throat> you know, you hear different teachers, and you've got to do this first, and then, uh, and then, my method is the right one, and and all the others are rubbish or you know so there's you know you hear it in Thailand and then in the West you know strong views about how to practice and and uh, what the right way to do it and so and these oftentimes these views come from teachers or people like scholars and that seem to have a sense of authority and know what they're talking about so that you know the one you know I've been through this myself so I know the effect it has on me you know like when when an authority says you're wrong and you should do this not that you know then of course if I start operating from just reacting to it then I I'm back in sakyaditi again in doubt or resentment or or being offended or feeling critical of the, of the person or just observing you know the maybe these these reactions emotional reactions I have about somebody telling me I'm all wrong is like this and this you can know directly you know it's not it's not it's not trying to justify your position or or put anyone down you know or say that that they're wrong but or to argue the point, but to use the situation for for knowing what you can know in the present. And and so, if somebody says something offensive to you, some rude statement that you know is wrong, even <laughs> you get more benefit if you just look at your own, you know, at the reaction, the emotional reaction you have from that, you know. And you begin, because then you're actually being mindful and discerning it in a way that is not being 
lost in in just uh, habitual reacting to the feeling of being offended or outraged by insulting remarks. Uh, this is in uh, you know in daily life, like we we have a monastic uh, vinaya. We're supposed to use right speech or proper speech, things like that. So it, you know, it, it's not. We try our best to be responsible, but still, speech is one of the more difficult ones to control. But in the worldly life, they don't have such uh, <laughs> demands on you. You know, so you can just say anything you want, and <laughs> and the things you hear, you know, in the world are. Pretty awful, you know, the insults and the blame. So, so, you know, if you've ever listened to, you know, like in in England, the House of Commons, they they record their sessions on Radio Four, BBC, and you know, for such a polite society, when these <laughs> members of Parliament get together in the House of Commons. You wouldn't believe how <laughs> arrogant and voracious and insulting and blaming. You know. So to be a politician in, in England, you have to really have a tough heart, you know. You can't be a wimp, you know, overwhelmed because somebody said you're a, you're a stupid idiot. You just... <laughs> <laughs> But we can uh, we can become so precious that we you know we get sometimes we we're over you know like uh, I see tendency in in uh, monasteries in in the in England to be overly politically correct to where you know you're you're trying to make everything not offensive to anyone and that's the way the society kind of would like it to just be terribly nice about everything <laughs> and that also <laughs> has, its, has its problems because messages don't get across or or people misunderstand or uh, you kind of never say anything that might upset somebody so what what's really important doesn't become very conscious for them so this uh, is just learning from experience, but you're the kind of, you're the path itself, each one of you, you know, you, it's here is a path, you know, it's not out there or in me or somebody else, it's, and this is what you learn from the way you are, you know, and it doesn't matter, you know, whether, you, you know, you're a really refined good person or a coarse one, but whatever way you see yourself is what you learn from, because the discerning ability is is non-critical. It's not about me as being right or wrong, but it's discerning the tendency to to, to uh, give myself, be critical of myself or of others is like this. When I feel uh, very uh, critical of somebody else, then I can be aware it's like, I feel like this, you know, I begin to observe this, this kind of feeling of bringing up this person's name and then these kind of proliferations that I listen to it. So I begin to get a feeling for what it's like to, to dwell on my distaste for somebody is like this. And then you, you, you're observing it, you're discerning that it is, it is what it is. And then you recognize if I start grasping this and going along with it, then I get pulled into a whole kind of habit tendency of anger and blame and and uh, rage even. But if I observe it, then it's, it's cultivating, it's bhavana, it's not just me trying to, you know, grin and bear it, it's actually using it, the first noble truth, second noble truth. Then, uh, this uh, discerning ability is, you know, I find uh, because we, we do, you know, 
the, the planet, the central world is all dualistic. It's about birth and death. Uh, you know, so everything we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, think, and feel is, is as always, it's, it's conditions, it's, uh, it's, it's attributes, it's particular qualities, and, and, and of course, the Buddha summed it all up with the Anicca Dukkanat, all conditions are impermanent. Uh, so that because of the uh, uncountable infinite variety and uh, conditioned phenomena that we have to experience all the time, you know, how do you sort it out? How can you get any perspective on it? Because one condition, you know, if you attach to this condition, you, a condition can't see another one. You're just bound into uh, the limitation of the condition you're attached to. So then this non-attachment is uh, it's, it's non-attachments like this, and then you then you have perspective on your on the conditions conditions that you're experiencing, right? whether it's personal or external, whether it's through seeing what you see or hear, smell, taste, touch, think or feel, whether it's uh, personal or impersonal, good or bad, right or wrong, it's seen, it's discerned as Sankara, uh, you know, as conditioned phenomena, as phenomena, as uh, all phenomena is changing. And that which is aware of phenomena is not that. That is, uh, that is the path and the non unconditioned, unborn, uncreated, through this awareness, sati, sampatanya. Sampatanya is like, it's intuitive, it's a, it, it embraces the moment, everything. It's not a, it's not a critical thing where you're just focusing on one thing and, and dismissing the rest. But it, it allows us to, like we, we, in English, we use the word usually like mindful when you drive the car or when you're crossing the street, you know, look both ways and mindful when you, you know, in this path because there's some stuff and so we, we think of mindfulness always as being aware of a particular object or a situa- difficult uh, situation. But in Sati Sampatanya, that they combine in this, this present moment, which uh, is our ability to embrace the totality of this moment with all, with all the conditions still operating in it, but our relationship to the this moment is no longer going from one thing to another, you know, in terms of our like or preference or attraction or aversion, but to to be the knower of it. It's like this. And so this is why, like, Sampatanya allows this this broad spectrum of total and uh, with with this with all that is present including the body, the breath, the posture, and all the, the conditions that are affecting you that, that, are, that are discernible in this present moment. And, then, uh, and so this is a, a way of training oneself for this intuitive, for this awareness level that is liberating from birth and death. So you have, a, have the this uh, get beyond just the limitation of, of conditions of birth and death. Now you can't conceive that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an intuit, it's an insight, it's not, it, you can't describe that, but you can recognize it through this sati sampachanya and discern, you know, by, by investigating Condition phenomena first, no longer from cultural biases or personal preferences, but just observing it as it really happens in the present, you know, what arises, ceases. And then that, as you, as you begin to pay more attention just to con- phenomena as it, at, as you're experiencing it, it's no longer a theoretical or Philosophical or psychological is just like this. Then you, 
you, you, you, and using the Four Noble Truths as a kind of way of reminding yourself what to do with it or not to do, and then you, you become, you have the insight into the path itself. And until you have, until you, you see through the, you, you know, you, the three fetters, first three fetters, and then there's never, there's always doubt it's going to follow you around, you know, wherever you go, whether you go off to a beautiful, peaceful mountain top with devas bringing you Vindabot food every day, <laughs> or live in a slum in Bangkok or whatever or anything in between and then you know if, if the these fetters are still the the uh, have never been recognized then we we're still subject to doubt you know we're still thrown about and you can see how in the in the story of the Buddha you know in the, in the scripture the print the, uh, the ascetic Gotama you know the Prince Siddhartha leaves the palace, becomes the ascetic Gotama, practices asceticism, develops the powers, and all these, you know, special qualities, special concentration abilities, and, and yet, at the end of the day, after six years of that, recognizing that, that still, you know, this isn't it, you know, this is, this is not in it. It's still too, it's still conditioned phenomena that, that is refined, but it, it's not the escape from suffering. And so then the, then the insight that the Buddha had to become the Buddha was recognition of the, of the not of concentrating the mind and refining conscious conditions in consciousness but in in opening everything up to reality in the present and then his uh, his uh, first sermon of course is the Four Noble Truths so that that is um, you know quite significant that, I mean it was it's a brilliant way of of uh, dealing with the human condition that we all share you know, it's not about being um, uh, an aesthetic for six years or being, you know, proficient in all the, the concentration practices or having been a prince, a uh, royal family or anything like that. It's about the common common reality that we share with all, all creatures, in fact, you know, with the animal kingdom and what. Uh, but with the human, the human... Uh, have this reflective Buddha mind. You might call it a Buddha mind. We can actually reflect on ourselves. We're not just conditioned by the forms we're in. You know, we're not just helplessly caught in instinctual patterns of behavior according to our species. We can actually contemplate the species. And, and, you know, through sati sampachanya, sati panya, the human side, being human is like this. Now, I don't think animals can do that, you know. Like the cats at Amaravati, and get them to contemplate, what is it like to be a cat? <laughs> <laughs> what do you feel like when you kill a bird? <laughs> they never quite register. <laughs> Uh, you know, if we kill a bird, what do you feel like? They could say that, and then you would, you know, you, you could observe maybe guilt or remorse or whatever uh, through some kind of cruel action you, you commit. And, and so this is like the reflective mind, the Buddha, Buddha nature, they, they use these words, but it's the ability that, like, to be able to observe be the buttos of knower of the world rather than just a creature caught in the comic condition of form that is, is conscious and just operating through 
the momentum of karma and and uh, conditioning. So I'll stop here.